Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Hey, I'm Mark Clifton. This is Mark Halleck. Hey, hey, what's up? We're going to talk about eight reasons today that pastors are afraid of revitalization. Mm, this, pa- this podcast is Revitalize and Replant. 80% of our churches need to be revitalized. The other 20 or 90, other 10 or 20% are going to need to be revitalized. And let's talk about the importance of revitalization. And, you know, some sometimes associations, state conventions don't use the word revitalization because it still has some stigma to it. It's like people don't want to admit mm. it. So let's talk about renewal or refresh or something. Yeah. But we all need to be constantly thinking about that. Yeah. And so... One of the reasons churches are in a situation, many of them where they are in decline, is that really, to be honest about it, pastors are afraid of revitalization mm. and the cost that it might encounter, they might encounter in revitalization. So this comes from Thomas Rayner. I don't even, do you know Tom? Tom. Well, Dr. I think Tom. He's, I think he's written a book. He's written has, a few. Has he, has he written a book? He's Maybe. A few. Two. He has the cool. He just two books. You know, I, I did. I was fortunate to do a podcast with Dr. Rayner for about five years. Got to know him really well, and he 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 became a really close friend. Still is a very close friend. But I used to. I think he written thirty some books or something. Yeah. And at that point, I, I had written one. And so I sometimes I would introduce the podcast by saying, I'm glad to be with Dr. Rayner and I. Between us, we've written 32 books. <laughs> He's written 31. I've written Very one. impressive. Very impressive. So thank you, Dr. Rayner, for these. These are great. I love these. Eight reasons you as a pastor might be afraid of revitalization. Yep. Number one, revitalization requires a long-term vision of the church. Talk about how challenging long-term vision is. Yeah, yeah, we're prone to short-term vision, right? Or or, or put it this way, we may have a a long-term vision, but we want it to happen overnight. And I think in in revitalizing a church, you know, in in fact, our uh, our elders have just recently finished a 30-year vision deal that we- 30 30 years. years, 30 years. We asked the question, by God's grace, where do we want to be when we're out of here in 30 years? If the Lord gives us 30 more years together, a 30-year vision, and then how are we going to get there? So now that may seem extreme, but I would say this. When you're going into a dying church, you need to recognize this is not going to happen overnight, mm-hmm. and we need to have a long-term vision. But I think what what uh, Rainer's saying here is a lot of guys— are afraid of that because they're afraid of they're that. They're afraid of it because they're afraid of it because it it's gonna it's gonna require a lot of planning, a lot of financial commitment, a lot. It's easier just to plan for next year. That's right, and it means you've got to stick around. You've got to stay through thick and thin, through good and bad. It's you can't just jump say, ship. Yeah, what are we gonna do the next twelve months? Yeah, and I know Andy Addis, our good friend, and he works on our team at, at Crosspoint in Hutchinson. You know, Andy, they have this thing where they want to reach. Was it one percent? Or two percent of each. I, I shouldn't. Know I think that. it's. I can't remember. I think you, it is it one or two, or is it ten percent? Maybe I think it I might want, be ten percent of the five ten- percent. We have we, we have no <laughs> idea. It's some percentage. We have no idea what we're talking about. If you want a real podcast, go listen to Tom Rainer because we just we're just winging it here. Okay, let's just assume, and uh, we'll we'll put it in the correct one in the show notes. All right. But a I bunch think of it, people. It, it may be 5%. Yeah. I think it okay. says they reach 5% of a community. Okay. Okay. And most of their communities are like, you know, uh, 2,000, 3,000 people because they're in rural areas. They have this network of churches. Yeah. So he says, you know, if, if we have 5% of a community of, of two, maybe I think it is 10%. I think it's 10%. It is 10%. I think it's 10. So if we have 10% of a community of 2,000 people, then we got 200 people. Yeah. And he said, especially in a community like that, you know, you're really having an influence. So they have this long term vision of every community they go in of impacting with the gospel and seeing come to faith in Christ and being part of their church, 10% of the population, yeah. all right? That's a huge long-term goal. Yeah, yeah. I've got another friend uh, uh, here in Kansas City in the Sin Network, and his church, his goal is to have a congregation in every one of the municipalities of the greater Kansas City area. Mm. That's like 40. Wow. So they want to have, over well, the next 20 years, they, those are huge visions, yep. right? Yep. That means you're going to stay there. Yep. That means you, and, and for many pastors, that's intimidating. Yep. I can't think that big. Mm. And so one of the hindrances for pastors and revitalization is an inability and a fear of making long-term visions. And so you're sitting there saying, Clifton, Mark, 
how in the world do I do that? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked. Mm. You talk to people like Mark Halleck who are doing it. Mm. You talk to people like Andy Addis who are doing it. Yep. You talk to people in Kansas City like Matt Miller who are doing it. You talk to these guys who have done that and you learn from them. That's exactly right. You're humble enough to say, man, can you mentor me in this? Can yep. you teach me in this? Yep. But in revitalization, you got to have some long-term 20, 30-year yeah, vision. Agree. That's awesome, man. Okay. That's so good. Number two. Number two is uh, a second uh, fear is it requires facing reality. I know. We talked about this in a previous one, the dangers of denial yeah. in revitalization. And we always want to say it's really not as bad as we think it is. <laughs> and I used to talk about that when I was, you know, back in my – most of my ministry, I was financially very poor – and I would have really bad cars. I mean, I would get the cheapest got, car I could yeah. drive or, yeah. the, you know, or whatever. And, and the tires would be awful, right? <laughs> and I'd look at them and go, those are really bad. But then I go, you know, I, I think they can make it a little longer. It's got some more know. miles it's to go. Got, yeah. and, then, and then one of them would start showing some cord, right? You'd see the metal and go, well, okay. So you pull into a place, a used tire place. You ever been to a used tire place? <laughs> no. I have been to many. I know where all the used. <laughs> I used. Used I, tire place. Yes, used tire place. I have bought used tires. Dude, I was a real pastor, all right? So I would pull oh, into this man. used tire place, and you pull into this used tire place, and you go, hey, uh, what do you got that fits this? Yeah, and and yeah, they would yeah. find one, and they go, you know, your others look pretty bad. Yeah, I know, but the cord's not showing yet. Yeah. Okay, that's denial, all right? That is denial. And, and, and it's just easier sometimes to deny the yep. reality than to figure out how yep. to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, that's so right. That's right. <laughs> I, I, really, I really think we should probably realize that denial is a terrible place to be. It is. And, but it's a comfortable place to be. It's comfortable. Because it means I don't have to make any changes. That's and exactly when right. I say denial is you, we don't have any children in the children's area. Mm. We haven't seen anybody baptized in three years. We have very few people under the age of 40 in any kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. I don't have any deacons in their 30s. Yeah. Guys, if, if that's your case, yeah. unless your church is in the middle of Sun City, Arizona, yeah. you're probably in denial. Yep. Number three is it demands patience. This is, a, this is a third reason why pastors are afraid of revitalization or can be. It demands patience. And in our flesh, many of us, we're not very patient. We don't want to practice patience. No. And yet revitalization demands patience. Right. And one of the key elements of being a revitalizing pastor is tactical patience. Yep. And that means this. Just because just because we still do it doesn't mean I, I necessarily agree to it or we're going to do it forever, but we're going to do it for now. Now, I'm not talking about theological things. Obviously, we don't have any patience when it comes to teaching uh, uh, bad theology. Yeah. But when we talk about the structure of the building, the governance of the church, the structure of the worship service, the different things like that, you're just going to have to have some patience. And revitalization takes patience. We want change. We want it right now. That's right. And, and I'm that way. I, I, I get my mind on something. I can't even sleep until yeah. it's done. Just want to get it done. To, I've got to get this done. Yeah. I cannot put it off. I love, you know, it's amazing how the Lord puts us with different kinds of people. So with my dear wife, so many times uh, I'll, I'll say, for instance, we, we, in our house, we have this laundry room, right? And it's just a white laundry room. It's, and I, you walk through it every time I do because <laughs> it goes from our... You never know what you're going to learn in this podcast, hey, do listen, you? Laundry so rooms. You go, for, you go from my garage into our kitchen, you know, not the front door, but the garage door. You walk through this laundry room, and it's all white. The cabinets are white. Mm -hmm. The washer and dryer is white. The walls are white. And so I told Jill, I said, you know, that's like the most bland room in the house and it's the one I walk through every time I come home or I leave or you walk I said we just need to so I showed her some stuff on Pinterest yes I went Pinterest. to Pinterest I went to Pinterest oh my word that's right who not are you not only do I look for used tire stores I thought I knew you I Clifton. went to Pinterest and there was things on Pinterest where people had these big huge like like flowers or big huge like like fruit pick decals all over these rooms yeah. and just Made them pop, man. Made them look great. Yeah, yeah. And I showed them to Jill. She said, you know, that would be really fun. I said, great. Here's where we can order them. Oh, we're not going to do it now. 
Well, why not? We got to think about this. What do we got to think about? I want to cover the walls with big oranges. Oh, no, we got to think. I don't want to think about it, Mark. You're not going to order those right now. I know how you are. We have to think about this. And so we think about it and we look at it. And every day I'm wanting to order the oranges. And she does, do we want bananas on the wall? Do we want flowers on the wall? Do we want other things on the wall? Do we really want anything on the wall? Maybe we want to paint the walls. I want oranges on the wall. Okay, well, two months later, we have oranges on the wall. <laughs> but she had to process she, through yes. that, and she did it right. Yep. And so, again, it takes patience. It and takes sometimes patience. sometimes those of That's us right. in church leadership, yeah. we just want oranges on the wall today. That's right. And you got to have patience. That's good, man. Number four, it requires prayer. It requires prayer. Why do you think that that would be considered uh, something that maybe pastors are afraid of when it comes to revitalization? Because as... As Don Whitney said, there's nothing about prayer that appeals to our flesh. Wow. And uh, as uh, we've said yeah. many times, we often want to go, we often want to pray and then do the work of the mm-hmm. Lord. Mm-hmm. And the, that's just the opposite. Prayer is the work, and then God does, He does the work. Our that, work is the prayer. Amen. And prayer is work. That's why we don't do it. That's right. Real prayer is work. It's work. It, re- it involves confession of sin. Yep. It involves a brokenness. It involves a discipline to mm-hmm. focus on Him. It's hard work. Turn your phone off. Turn, turn your, your screens off. off. Yep. Be disciplined in it. And there's probably very few pastors who are listening to me right now including me, who say, you know, one of the things I don't have any struggle with is prayer. Man, mm. I, I, I got that down. I, I can't spend enough time in prayer. I pray every day. Mm. I get up praying. I go to bed praying. Every time I find five minutes, I want to go to prayer. Most of us don't live that way. That's true. And so it is a battle to have an attitude yep. of prayer. Okay, let's bust through these last ones. Number five, uh, it might require asking for help. We've talked about that before. We've talked about that in the yep. previous one. It will require asking for help, which is another sign of humility. Yep. And you have to be humble. And in asking for help, you've got to be teachable. Teachable. I, Dude, I sit it. down with so many yep. guys. And I love you all. I really do. But you call me or you text me. Hey, I'd like to have some time with you. And then you... You, you, and the reason you call me and text me is because, hey, I'm, our church is really struggling. We're maybe even have to close. We've been declining. And when I sit down with you, many of you, you just sort of want to prove to me you're still a good pastor. Mm. You still know what you're doing. Mm. It's not like you're acknowledging, hey, I need help. It's almost like, would you just confirm that I'm do- I've am i got yes, to figure it out? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's like, man, just tell me you need help. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. That's right. No, it's good. Number six is it requires stick to itness. So yes. it was sticking to it. Yeah. And that's that long haul piece. No, too. and it's hard because in this day and age, we live in North America where there are 50,000 Southern Baptist churches. Mm-hmm. And if you're in the deep South or the mid South, there's tens of thousands of churches all over the place. And you can get so frustrated. And now it's so easy to apply to another church. Find another church. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 75 years ago, you would never have a church, you'd never have a resume. It was considered hmm. 75 or 80 years ago, you would, that would be, you would never have a resume. Hmm. And by the way, That's since we're, this, hope you're still listening to this podcast because we're going to swerve into something really controversial here. Probably even 40 years ago in the 1980s, you might know who might be running for president of the Southern Baptist Convention. It, it might kind of get out there, but nobody nobody politic. There was no campaign. There was no campaigning. <laughs> nobody announced in February, I'm a candidate. Interesting. Nobody put together a little logo and said, here's my platform. Hmm. You, you just didn't do that. Yeah. The convention would be there and people would be nominated. Now, I'm not saying people didn't talk about it ahead of time and there was a little bit people knew below the surface, but the idea that somebody would announce hmm. never happened. Hmm. 75, 80 years ago, the idea that somebody would write up a resume is a, didn't happen. Now, you might let the director of missions know or the state convention know, hey, I'm willing to make a change. And they yeah. might let a church know, and that church would send a public committee to listen to you. But you didn't drive it. You though. didn't drive yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, hmm. I mean, you come up with a great resume, and then you go online, and here are all these churches that need pastors. And with one touch of your keyboard, Mm -hmm. you can send your resume to 50 churches, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So leaving is much easier today than it used to be. Also, are you ready for this? It used to be, you know, you had a parsonage, right? Mm -hmm. So you were in that house, the church owned the house Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. You were really kind of connected to all of that. 
uh, and it's a whole other story. So today, it's much easier to leave the church. It is, is what I'm saying. That's right. And that's why you got to have stick to it in this and say, I'm not leaving. I remember there was a, a young man that was really capable. He took a church and it was just blowing up and going great. And God was had his hand all over him. And I remember he, he said seven years. He said, God has called me to be here seven years. He said, I wrote seven years and I put it on my, like on my bathroom mirror. He said, I put it on my computer in my office on the screen because as I was always getting contacts from directors and missions and other churches saying, man, you've done a great job here, but here's a tremendous opportunity. Mm. And he said, I just said, no, seven years. I'm mm. going to be here seven years. Stick to itiveness. I love it. Number right. seven, we got two more. Oh, we do? Oh, okay. yeah. Number seven is it might mean hurting people you love. And, and that's, again, that talks about our family, right? Our mm-hmm. wives. It can be hard. It, 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 it is it, hard. It is hard. And we don't want to hurt our families. The eighth, the eighth one, and we won't say much more, we'll, we'll land this plane. Let's put it this way. It can be hard on people you love. Yeah, that's right. It can I, be I hard. And not really hurting people you love, but it can be really hard on people yeah, you love. Yeah, that's a better way to say and it. And you would like to say, man, I wish we had a, a, a nicer place for my family to go to church. The answer to that is, as we said before, is find another church in the community that can minister to your family. Yeah. And maybe let your kids go to that youth group. And maybe you and your wife go to mm-hmm. a small Bible study group during the week at another church. Yeah. But it's going to be hard on your family. That's right. And if you say, well, I don't want my put my family through that, then you're probably not going to be in revival. That's right, right. And number eight, the last one Rainer says here is it, it uh, requires taking a risk. And we've talked about yeah, that. Yeah, you got to take a risk. Yep. If you're not a risk taker, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Eight this. reasons pastors are afraid of revitalization. There you go. So we'll post those on the show notes and we'll be back, Lord willing, if we're not afraid to do this one more time next week. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.